Hi, hi everyone. Thanks for attending my presentation. Uh, today I'm going to talk about spoiler. Spoiler is a new side channel attacks, a new vulnerability we found last year uh, on Intel processors. Uh, this is a joint work by Worcester Polytechnic Institute and University of Lübeck in Germany uh, with the list of co-authors that uh, is in the paper. Uh, so I think uh, uh, it's kind of uh, obvious to talk about some optimization problems in Intel CPUs when we talk about vulnerabilities. Uh, we have heard about a spectra attack, we have heard about cache attacks, and these attacks target various components in the CPU that are actually made to make CPU work faster. Uh, but if we look deeper, like, okay, what other things computer architects do to make CPU faster, there are lots of uh, speculation going on within the core. So uh, why not just uh, speculate on uh, speculations and find, okay, what other things they do in the core? Uh, I mean, there are various buzzwords, like in the, in the Intel patents, other patents from other vendors, like, a speculative prefetching, a speculative event counters, and a speculative load operations. So uh, this talk and a spoiler, of course, focus on the speculative load operations, and uh, that's an optimization mechanism by, uh, designed by Intel processors. So uh, if, we, if we see like uh, the process or how these load operations are executed in an out-of-order fashion and in a speculative way, uh, we can Think about like a, like a demonstration here that, okay, we have a, we have a eight, eight stage pipeline that uh, fetch the instruction, decode them and execute them. If we execute uh, some store instruction and followed by a load instruction, we probably expect the pipeline to use, uh, use these resources in, the, in various stages as much as possible. So the pipeline is gonna fetch and decode and while it's fetch and decode the first instruction, try to fetch the second instruction and use these resources as as much as possible. So, but at some point the pipeline may just, uh, may just get a stall on some instruction and, and those instructions may just compete for the same resource. Uh, so in particular, the processor may just say, load instructions are really important, so I want to really execute them fast and I don't want to lose any time on computation because of a load instruction is blocked. Uh, so what processors do, they just say, okay, let, let's just execute the load instruction, whatever, and I'm gonna also execute what other instructions depend on that load instructions, and, and then later on we'll figure out uh, if this load instruction had any dependency on the store instructions before. Uh, well, we want to compute things correctly. We don't want to just uh, compute something garbage, right? So. We need to detect if there is a dependency between this load instruction and any of the store instructions. So we need to basically, before committing the results of the load and other instructions uh, to, the micro, to the architectural states, we need to compare the value, the addresses of the load with other stores that happened before that. And these stores, of course, are not committed. So, so we don't know if, uh, if they are complete or uh, in flight. So, what we do, we, do, we need to compare. We need to compare the addresses with this, this, or this, and some of them may be dependent. So if a dependency detected, we're gonna basically flush the pipeline and execute everything again. Uh, but sometimes it, this dependency is not really that guaranteed, and the processor may just uh, falsely think that something is dependent on something else. And that has to do with addresses. So we mentioned we have to compare addresses, uh, address of the load with uh, stores, uh, what are these addresses? So we know that when we write a program, we are dealing with virtual addresses. These virtual addresses has to translate to physical addresses to, to be able to access various memory components on the, on the core and off the core. Uh, the processor used something like TLB to cache these uh, translations, and if the TLB doesn't have the translation, it uses something like page mishandler to basically perform the translation. So, and then the translation, uh, with the help of the OS, is gonna give us a new address, which is called the physical address. And the translation, of course, only translates the upper bits of the address, and the last 12 bits are the same, because we work on page granularity, uh, so we know that the last 12 bits of the virtual and physical address are the same. Uh, but physical address is important, generally, because that's how we map DRAM banks, that's how we map L3 cache, and, and some other components. So, 
with that, we, we see we have some design challenges. If you are, I'm not a computer architect, but uh, computer architects always deal with these problems. Okay, what should we do? We, we don't even have the translation result yet. Should we just wait for all the stores to complete, or should we, uh, should we just uh, forward the data from the store to load and see maybe this data was the data of the load? Uh, this creates lots of uh, questions. Okay, how am I doing this really? How do I detect if there is a dependency or not? So we get to a spoiler. Uh, so a spoiler basically focuses on this problem, okay, how these address dependencies are actually checked and compared with each other. Uh, so we, we looked at how Intel processor deal with this problem, and basically there is a component called memory order buffer inside the core, which memory order buffer is where all this magic of uh, memory ordering and address dependency checks are happening. Uh, memory order buffer has some store buffer and load buffer, and a store buffer can have some metadata about the address information and other, other stuff in the core. Uh, so w one thing that we have noticed that is mentioned in various like Intel documents that the store buffer actually may not contain the full, full physical address. And this means that basically these address checks might be really uh, difficult. And there is, a, there is a whole pattern on this that's how to resolve false dependencies on speculative load instructions. And there are lots of various confusing arg arguments how the upper address bits are checked. And uh, sometimes it's even mentioned that, okay, the upper physical address bits are partial address bits checks, or if the ad physical address bits doesn't exist, we're just, gonna, uh, we're just gonna assume this check has a dependency and it may be just a false dependency. So we came up with, uh, with an attack. Uh, we, and that the way the attack works is we basically try to check any address dependency on the upper address bit. So we pick a bunch of uh, virtual pages and we, we, try, we allocate these virtual pages and we, we use a window size to perform memory write to these uh, this virtual pages. So we do 64 memory writes and followed by a load operation. Uh, and we picked 64 because 64 is bigger than the, uh, bigger than the store buffer size. Uh, so we can fill all the store buffer entries. Uh, so when we load this memory operation and we measure the time, we expect the load operation to have maybe a variable timing because the store operation may actually create some sort of dependency problem. Uh, so we did this and we basically iterate over some addresses and at some point we hit an address that there is a very high latency for the load operation. And we were like kind of surprised when we saw that, that okay, there is a thousand cycle la latency is it really real? Do, do we do something wrong? And we did all sort of analysis with performance counters, et cetera, et cetera. And I said, yeah, it actually there is a thousand cycle delay for just one load operation. And of course, depending on the system, it's sometimes 500 cycles, a thousand cycles. Um, so we looked at what, what is the relationship of this store address and the load address. And we noticed that on the physical address, the eight bit of the physical uh, page, page frame and the physical page frame of the load operation are, ex are exactly the same. So this gives us two pieces of information. First of all, this is a side channel on the last 12 bits of any, any addresses. So we can actually use it, for instance, across context switches to leak some metadata, some information. And more importantly, we can actually learn something about physical page frames that we are not allowed to have access by default on, on any modern configuration. So and if we iterate over more addresses, we find more of these addresses, and we can basically use them uh, to conduct other attacks. Uh, so we're going to jump to cache attacks or, or how we can use this to do better cache attacks. So uh, cache attacks has been around for a while. There, is a, there are two common attacks that most people focus on. There is a flush and reload attack, and there is a prime and pro attack. Well, flush and reload is a, is a powerful attack, but uh, it has a strong assumption of shared memory, which is not available on all systems. And for instance, in sandbox environment or in JavaScript, we can also no, not do flush and reload. So, but there is other other attack called prime and pro, which is the more relevant attack and practical attack because you don't have such an assumption. Uh, for a prime and pro attack, we actually need to know how cache sets are mapped in the in the last level cache. Uh, so basically, if you want to, as an attacker, attack like a victim data that uh, has access to some sort of, uh, do a, some sort of secret dependent memory access, we need to know which set the victim access, and also we need to have 
uh, a good amount of addresses that they all map to that set. Uh, these sets generally can occupy, occupy some number of lines. Uh, for instance, here we say eight lines per set. Uh, on Intel processors nowadays, it's 16 lines per set on last level cache. So we need to have eight or 16 uh, number of addresses that they all map to the same set. Uh, so how can we do that? Well, previous work either assumed that there is some sort of misconfiguration on the system or some sort of assumption about physical address, or they try to uh, brute force these addresses to find, to find some eviction sets, or there are some, of course, improved work on algorithms on that. Uh, but if we just know some information about physical page, page number, we can, just, we can just go ahead and create eviction sets much faster and more reliably. And uh, the reason for that is, uh, so on Intel processors, we use the upper, upper bits after the six bit to map to uh, these sets. And, uh, so we already know six bits of it, but uh, the other bits are different from virtual to physical address. And with the help of a spoiler, we learn another eight bit, and we already know 14, we, we, we basically know 14 bits. And this makes eviction set creation much faster, so we can, uh, for instance, do a prime and pro attack on LLC uh, faster and more reliable. So we implemented this in JavaScript, and of course, uh, in, in native environment, we, we got a very good speed up, but in JavaScript, we had some noise. Uh, so we didn't get like 256 times the speed up on eviction set creation, but we still got a good amount of speed up and accuracy. Uh, and you can check the paper for more comparison result on that. Uh, the other thing we want to discuss is how the spoiler uh, basically improved raw hammer attack. So the similar concept applies to raw hammer where uh, memory banks in the DRAM are mapped using the physical address. Uh, so <coughs> there are some requirements to perform a successful raw hammer attack. Uh, first of all, we need to collocate uh, in the same bank as a victim bank and to be able to flip a bit uh, in the same bank and create a row buffer conflict. And the other requirement is that we need to have, uh, for a double-sided row hammer, we need to have access to contiguous memory pages. Uh, so a spoiler can actually help us to relax these problems and actually improve the attacks uh, in a practical sense. So we don't need to have access to any physical information or just brute force addresses. Um, so we did some experiments how, how, can, how we can use a spoiler for that. Uh, we used the drama tool to actually reverse engineer uh, some, some computer configuration, some laptop configuration. And we noticed that generally maybe between 19 to 20 to 3 bits of addresses are actually used to map the physical address to the DRAM banks. And of course, maybe with some configurations, more bits are used. Uh, and then if we already know 20 bits, uh, then this makes it much easier because we have a high prob probability to cause row buffer conflicts. Uh, so this is good for a single-sided row hammer, but how about double-sided row hammer? For double-sided row hammer, uh, we use another feature of a spoiler to actually detect contiguous memory. And the way we do that is basically, uh, so when we run a spoiler and we find these peaks uh, because, they, because they have the common 8-bit same, so they happen, uh, if, if the memory is contiguous, they should happen af after every 256 page. Uh, so we did this, such an experiment and we noticed that, okay, every time these peaks become consistent and they are 256 steps apart, we actually get contiguous memory. So then we start just hammering that contiguous memory instead of, uh, instead of uh, just randomly hammering random addresses. And then uh, we notice that we can get bit flips in like between 10 to 20 seconds on, on some of the configurations that we couldn't get bit flips with like random hammering uh, using existing tools. Uh, which this is, I think, uh, an important uh, step for raw hammer attack because in raw hammer attacks, we basically uh, need to hammer correctly with a large amount. So if we lose time on hammering wrong, wrong addresses, we might end up hammering for two weeks and not getting a single bit flip. Uh, so a sto the story of the vulnerabilities here, uh, how we did the responsible disclosure, which wasn't very coordinated. And uh, yeah, and I mean, uh, so, so we disclosed the issue, we contacted, we got some acknowledged, okay, we received, but no action was performed, and then at some point we re released the paper. 
And, and the CV was assigned actually after we released the paper uh, and after media picked up the issue. And uh, thanks to media, we got some free logos, which uh, I don't know, that's like a CPU that's burned. I don't know what is that, like a heart bleed with a spectra. I don't even know why, but, but I, I like the one in the middle. At, at least it matches the name. So, and uh, yeah, that's the story. Uh, any questions? Okay, thank you very much for your talk. Are there any questions, please? Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I have a couple of questions about your Rohammer experiments. Uh, were those done with DDR3 only, or did you use DDR4 at all? Uh, we only did with DDR3. And have you made any changes to the BIOS of those platforms? No. So, so like, was, was memory interleaved across different DIMMs and across different banks and ranks? Uh, so what do you exactly mean by interleaved between different ranks and banks? So one feature with DRAM is to sort of interleave memory and make sure that mm -hmm. consecutive physical addresses go to different banks. That is a performance optimization. Okay. To basically sort of access banking in parallel when you actually do oh. some. Well, we and had in, we in had general. Some in general, it's my impression that these raw hammer attacks actually turn off all of these things because the moment you actually bring interleaving, your your addresses scatter thro throughout your whole. Okay. Well. Uh, I so we, we didn't change any configuration of the, of the system. Uh, okay. and Let me ask a different question then. How much memory did you have on those, in those platforms? Was it just one DIMM? Or were there laptops? We, we, we ha we, there were, lap there were <sighs> some laptops and desktop too. But on the de desktop, we had like uh, two, two DIMM. And uh, we had a setup with uh, like a dual channel two, two DIMM. And uh, cool. yeah. No, but, but the, the work is cool, so I yeah. just have quick, yeah. But I, I understand that, for instance, if you want to do the same attack on a system that has maybe lots of DRAM, of course, the attack, uh, the attack probably becomes I, harder. I do think that this side channel yeah. way of actually reverse engineering the physical mapping is great, so it's, yes, thank you. Hi, my name is Guru Raj, from, I'm from Georgia Tech. Uh, this is great work, uh, love the presentation, thanks. Um, I had a question more around uh, mitigation uh, approaches. Mm -hmm. uh, so given that memory disambiguation is sort of, uh, um, at least computer architects have believed that that's going to cause a lot of overhead, uh, so they have a lot of prediction. Yeah. Um, short of turning it off, is there any other way to prevent this side channel, in your opinion? Well, if, if you talk about general microarchitecture, I'm not an architect, but I assume uh, there are ways to implement this to make it uh, not like this, right? And for instance, we couldn't reproduce the same thing on AMD. And not that AMD is a better CPU, but maybe we can find something else on that. But, uh, but uh, from the practical aspect, Intel didn't uh, provide any hardware or plan to fix this in hardware. And uh, they provided some guidance on how to prevent side channel attacks in software in general. Uh, yeah. Thanks. OK. So uh, I think we should move to the next talk. So uh, let's uh, thank the speaker again.